Thank you. Please be seated. We'll be back on the record. Uh, the court just returned back from from lunch. Uh, the state had finished their direct examination of Special Agent Daniels. Um, we're moving on to cross. Is that correct, Mr. Pryor? Yes, Your Honor, it is. Special Agent Daniels, if you want to come forward again, you can have a seat at the witness table. You're still under oath. You can remove your mask once you get there. Mr. Pryor, you may inquire when you're ready. I, I guess I want a clarification as to uh, how I uh, address you. Is it a special agent or is it as agent, or how would you prefer that I address you, sir? Agent is fine. Agent is acceptable to you? Yes, sir. All right, I will try to make a point of referring you as Ag Agent Daniels. Thank you. Okay. Agent Daniels, uh, can you give me an idea of how many people were at the scene on the June, uh, June 9th uh, warrant in terms of uh, law enforcement? We have a crime scene sign-in log, so I would ultimately ref refer to that to make that assessment. Um, just, to, just to give an, a, an estimation, I would estimate we probably had about 50, 50 law enforcement personnel, maybe, maybe up to 100 people. Was anybody at the FBI uh, um, designated as the person to uh, watch family members and the residents of the home? I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Were you the chief officer in charge of all operations at that scene at the time? No, sir, I wasn't. Okay, who was? I was the senior team leader responsible for the processing of the crime scene, okay. not of over all operations that day. Okay. Do you have any idea who was the chief officer in charge of all operations that day? Uh, I guess I, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you that, no. Okay. What's an administrative log? The administrative worksheet or administrative log is the, the evidence response team paperwork that I, as the team leader, would be responsible for filling out. And that's something that you maintain in your possession, is that correct? Yes. Th that throughout the day, that would be something that I would be filling out. And there's, there's a chance that I could have another team member or somebody else fill out that log. It doesn't have to be just me, but that would be my responsibility. And then the safekeeping of that log would be in your responsibility? Would be your responsibility? Again, that could be me. I'd be the primary person responsible for that log, but I could designate another team member to fill out that log. For example, that log is also on a, there's a digital format for that log, which is on a laptop. So if one of my team members was working that laptop, they could be filling out that information on the laptop. And ultimately, at the conclusion and when the reports are written, that administrative log is something that you refer to and you provided it to the prosecutor, correct? Yes, at the very end of the day, I would go over, I would review those logs, and then I would submit that with my report as an attachment to my final report. Okay, thank you, officer. Thank you, Agent Daniels, I'm sorry. Um, you talked about surveying uh, of the crime scene. Uh, there were a number of pictures, a uh, number of photos, a significant number of exhibits, and you described what you called the pet cemetery. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, now um, you described that your dig area was approximately a 10 by 10. Is that what you were saying? Is that Mr. Pryor, I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing you again. Can you pull that right in front of you? Thank you. The crime scene that you described as the pet cemetery, uh, you, you had noted that there was like a 10 by 10 area. Is, is that correct? The area that I described as the pet cemetery, once we were there, my estimation of its size was 10 feet by 10 feet square. Okay, would it surprise you that that area is almost 20 by 20? Uh, objection assumes facts not in evidence. I'm not offering facts. I'm asking if it would surprise him whether or not the pet cemetery is twice as large as what he's re re suggesting. Overruled. Would it surprise you to learn that that pet cemetery is over 20 by 20? 
the, I designated my own pet cemetery area, so it wouldn't surprise me if somebody else had their own pet cemetery okay. area, no. And that's what I guess I want to clarify, officer, and I'm not trying to imply that you're being in any way um, um, suggesting anything otherwise. You designated an area that you felt was the pet cemetery based on where you thought they should should start ex excavation, correct? Correct. But it, but if you're viewing the pet cemetery from the from the aerial, uh, would it su it would not surprise you that it was a, a much larger area where the soil had been overturned? Would you disagree with that? I didn't assess where the pet cemetery was based on any aerial imagery. Okay. But did you base the pet cemetery of the 10 by 10 as the actual area that was all dug up and, and uh, 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 where the ground had been at least disturbed? So I made my assessment as to where the pet cemetery was based on my visual observation from the ground. And I determined a 10 foot, approximate 10 foot by 10 foot area. That was my designation. And that designation was an area within the pet, within the uh, the ground area that you felt was of, of uh, potential significance, correct? Correct. So in, in reality, the, the area, uh, there, there could be ground that expands beyond uh, what your designation is. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. So it could, so in, in simple terms, the pet cemetery you described could be much smaller than the pet cemetery that's visualized from the air or in, in reality what the actual size of it really is. Would that be fair? Yes, somebody else's pet cemetery could okay. be larger. Okay. So when you designated the pet cemetery and you decided to, to do the dig, you uncovered two animals, correct? That's what I observed, yes. Okay. And the, the two animals were never identified, is that fair? I observed the animals to be a, a dog and a cat. Okay. And then you mentioned, and, and you're basing that on your experience of what you think a dog and a cat look like? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you didn't dig up the entire ground around that area, did you? Not the entire ground, no. Right. And you mentioned that there were two or three other areas that could potentially be uh, cemetery areas close proximity to that property, correct? Uh, close proximities to what property? To the pet cemetery. With, within what I called the pet cemetery, there were two or three potential graves. Okay. Did you dig all of those up? Yes, sir. That area was, was excavated. Okay. But within the area outside of the pet cemetery where the ground was still disturbed and, and, and uh, 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 loose soil was evident, uh, you didn't dig up that entire area, did you? So the area that I assessed to be visually where I could see what I thought could be graves, that was excavated. Okay. With our data, our total station data and our ferro scanning data, okay. you will know, we will know what areas we excavated and what areas we didn't. Okay. And the area that you determined, and that's what's really important about what you're saying, because there's a distinction. The area that you designated as potential graves doesn't necessarily encompass the entire area where the soil in that 20 by 20 is located, is it? I don't know what 20 by 20 area you're referring to. Well, I, I made a representation that is it possible that the area that uh, you explored, known, that you're describing as the pet cemetery, uh, you designated how big that area was. But there's a possibility that the area that you're talking about is much bigger than 10 by 10 in terms of the soil that's disturbed in that area. Is that fair? Objection. He's misstating the, the witness's testimony. I'm not misstating anything. I'm asking him, you know, he didn't dig up the entire soiled ground in the area. Is that true? We did not excavate the entire property. That is true. Okay. We excavated the areas that I assessed that I called the pet cemetery okay. and the burial one and burial two locations. So you can't tell me to a certainty that there aren't any raccoons in the general area known as uh, that's that's marked where that that headstone is, correct? I'm not going to be able to tell you if there are other animals buried on any of the other property besides the locations we excavated. Right. So in other words, the simple answer is, is you didn't, ex ex you didn't uh, excavate the entire plat of land that there that was dug up. You ex excavated what you thought was designated as potential sites for uh, remains. Is that fair? That's not correct. Okay, well, why don't you correct me? Again, we excavated the pet cemetery 
that I designated, we uh, excavated burial site number one that I designated, right. we excavated burial site number two that I designated. Okay. Those locations, those specific locations are going to be documented in the data that our Faro scanner documented. Those locations are going to be documented in the total station data that we collected and documented. That information is going to be provided to you. That information is going to be provided to the prosecutor. From that, we will be able to make demonstrative exhibits, and you're going to be able to know exactly where those locations are that we excavated on this plot of land. Would it, would it surprise you to learn that I, um, I've been out there a number of times and I observed exactly where you excavated and it's obvious, obviously very um, um, clear. Would you disagree that you left an imprint when you did this excavation? I would not disagree. Okay. Would you disagree with me that there are, there are grounds and pieces of uh, property that, are, that have been disturbed, that are disturbed or that are, uh, um, um, the ground is not solid beyond what you designated as the pet cemetery. Would you agree or disagree with that? I would agree with that. Okay, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. So based on that, with these extra grounds around what you did, what only you decided was what you felt was relevant as far as the pet cemetery, there could be raccoons within that, or a raccoon within that property, correct? There could be raccoons right. on that property. Okay. Did you identify any other parcels of the property when you were out at the uh, Daybell residence that also had markings and indications of other pet cemeteries on the property? I did not. Okay, did you look in any other places other than the two sites you, you chose? So the rest of that property was searched. We conducted line searches of the entire property. We had five cadaver dogs search the entire property. So other searches were conducted of this entire property. Okay. And did the other searches, other than the cadaver dogs, include looking at places where the ground was also disturbed within the four acres that were out there? We assessed all three to four acres of this property looking for clandestine graves. Okay. And we stopped with our burial site number one, burial site number two, and once we discovered the human remains in burial site number one and burial site number two, and we recovered those remains. That was where we stopped. Okay. So you did not go around, and, and, you're, and, you're, and I'm, I'm interested in the phraseology that you use, we assessed. So I'm not really sure what we assessed means. Does it mean you looked at the ground? Does it mean you looked at the adjoining buildings? What does that exactly mean? Yes, sir. So in order to con conduct a line search, we were essentially in a line, and we looked at the ground very systematically, very methodically, and he went back and forth across his property, looking at the ground, looking for indications of a clandestine grave, because that's what we were there looking for. And explain to me what you refer to. You've used that expression a couple times. What do you refer to as clandestine? Please tell me. So an instance where somebody or persons are trying to hide human, or human remains in a grave, okay. in this case, an outdoor scene, an outdoor grave, similar to burial site one, where somebody has hidden the remains of a young boy okay. in burial site one, and then they place stones on top of that body. Right. And I appreciate that. On I'm top just, of I that body. Officer, Mr. Judge, Pryor. I'm going to object. It's going beyond the, uh, the, the question I asked. He's, he's embellishing and he's adding to his answer. And quite honestly, I'm going to move the court to strike the remainder of his answer as non-responsive. Your Honor, he asked the question. The agent answered his question. He, Judge, he can't move to strike that. Judge, I asked him what the definition of a clandestine, and then he took it upon himself to decide to, to add all of the other facts about what he calls the pet cemetery and the other, the other site. And quite honestly, it was absolutely unresponsive. What the officer is doing is he's trying to add more and more to the answer, and, and, uh, and quite honestly, I'm, I'm somewhat frustrated with his, uh, with his method of, of avoiding answering my question and yet getting in all sorts of additional information. So I'd like this witness directed to answer my questions. Mr. Pryor, you asked, what do you refer to as clandestine? Please tell me. Um, I listened to the witness's answer. 
it's clear the witness was describing what he referred to as a clandestine grave site. Uh, I'm, not going, I'm not going to strike that from the record. Okay. Now, you also talked about a fire pit. Yes, sir. And in relation to what you described as a, uh, a pet cemetery, where was the fire pit? Do you have a marker you could mark for me? Yes. So the fire pit was Just located. so the record's clear, which exhibit do we have on the, uh, the easel there, Mr. Wood? That's State's Exhibit 10. Exhibit 10 is being looked at. It's on the easel. The witness is using a laser pointer uh, pursuant to uh, Mr. Pryor's inquisition here. So June 9th, 2020's fire pit was located in this area. Okay. What to the... Uh, um, Closer to you, there's, it looks like there's some, some, some brown ground right to the, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure of, of actually the direction that is. Behind the house where you pointed to where you're saying there's a fire pit, um, why don't you point out where you think the pet cemetery is? So my pet cemetery that I described, that I assessed and found was right about there. Would it surprise you to learn that the, the, the fire pit is at least uh, 15 feet from where you're describing the pet cemetery? That wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Were there any indications that there had been any burning in that fire pit? Yes, sir. There was ash. Okay, there was ash. In, in inside and outside the fire pit area. Okay. How deep was um, burial site number one? Burial site number one was approximately one and a half feet. And I'm saying approximates here because I would, I would want to wait until we had the uh, scanner data to show the true measurements. And the uh, depth of um, the pet cemetery site? Uh, if, you're, if you're just wanting to know the pet cemetery excavation with the, uh, how deep we went with the uh, backhoe. No, with how deep you went before you recovered the, the remains. So the remains, I would say that was burial site number two, and I would estimate that was approximately two feet deep. And again, I would want to wait till we had the uh, Faro scanner data to be more precise. Now, when you talked about uh, burial site number one, you made reference to the fact that you... Um, observed a, uh, a garbage bag and then you removed the soil around that and you uh, touched the, uh, the garbage bag. Is that correct? To, to sort of identify what was in there, correct? Correct. And I would assume that you would be wearing some sort of uh, gloves. Would that be fair? Correct. Okay. Who was the anthropologist? I don't remember her name right off. There is a report that she drafted that is attached to my documentation. In the pet cemetery. Mr. Pryor, you pull that microphone a little Sorry, closer yeah. to you again. I'm going to do that a million times. It's very difficult. It's all right. I'll keep reminding you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Within the pet cemetery, I had an opportunity to go over pictures and, and observe some of this, and, and uh, I saw no sign of any ash within the soil. Would you agree? Objection, testimonial. There's a question to that that I'm leading up to, Judge. I think I got to give some leeway to do that. Mr. Wood? He just testified about what he saw. Okay, I'll, re I'll rephrase, Judge. There Please was do. no ash within the soil of the pet cemetery, was there? I'm sorry, I missed the first part. There of that. was no ash 
within the pet cemetery within the soil, correct? I, I didn't observe that. Okay, thank you. Judge, I have no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Any redirect, Mr. Wood? No, Your Honor. All right. You can be excused from this, the uh, witness stand, Agent Daniels. Thank you for being here today. May this witness be excused from court today. Mr. Pryor? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Wood? Yes. We'll allow for a moment to clean the witness cubicle. Mr. Wood, who is your next witness? Judge Spencer Rammel for the state. Mr. Rammel, who's your wit next witness? The state would call Lieutenant Joe Powell. Did you say Lieutenant? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Lieutenant Powell, if you'll please stand here in front of the witness stand, raise your right arm and face the clerk. Yes. Lieutenant Powell, you can be seated there at the witness stand. You can remove your mask. If you'll please point that microphone right at your chin. Make sure that you wait for the question to be answered before or asked before you answer. That'll make sure we're making a clear record. Mr. Ramley, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Can I have you state your name and spell your full name for the record, please? Joseph Rick Powell. Where are you employed? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed at Fremont County Sheriff's Office? 18 years. And how long in law enforcement overall? 18 years. And are you post certified? Yes. What are your current duties and responsibilities? I'm a lieutenant over patrol and detectives. I'm going to draw your attention to a specific date, January 3rd of 2020. Were you working that day? Yes, I was. What was your assignment that day? Help with the execution of a search warrant at the Daybell residence. Uh, the Daybell residence, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I believe the address is 202 North, 1900 East. Okay, and that's in Fremont County? Yes. Were other agencies involved in the execution of that warrant? Yes. Was FBI ERT, team, or ERT on scene? Yes, there was. And were you involved in the collection of evidence? Or the initial collection of evidence, I'm sorry? No, I was not involved in the initial collection. Uh, who involved, or what agency uh, collected initial evidence on the scene? Uh, I wasn't inside the residence when that was going on. At the end of the search warrant, or the end of the execution, uh, were any items found in the home turned over to you? Yes. By who? ERT. And where were you when you received that property? Inside the residence. How were those items packaged? In evidence bag bags. What did you do with them? I hauled them to my vehicle and uh, Detective Mattingly's vehicle. What did you do next? We transported them to the Fremont County Sheriff's Office and I turned it all over to Detective Mattingly to log into evidence. Were you involved in the logging of evidence at all? No. Judge, that's all I have for this witness. There won't be any questions from the defense, Judge. Lieutenant Powell, thank you for being here today. You can be excused from the witness stand. Mr. Ramel, are you going to call the next witness, or is Mr. Wood? I am, Judge. We'll take just a moment. Who is going to be your next witness, Mr. Ramel? Judge, of the state would next call Detective Bruce Mattingly to the stand. Okay. Detective Mattingly, if you'll come forward, stand here in front of the witness stand, raise your right arm and face the clerk. If you'll wait. There you go. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony about you and Cosmo Pitty will be the truth, the whole truth, and the truth of the truth of God? I do. Thank you. Detective Mattingly, if you can please sit down there, pull that microphone up to your chin. 
We're making a record. You can remove your mask once you're seated there. Mr. Ramel, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Can I have you state your name and spell your full name for the record, please? Brewster Mattingly. Spelling of last is M-A-T-T-I-N-G-L-Y. Where are you employed? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been employed in that capacity? I've been employed with Fremont County for 20 years. And how long in law enforcement overall? 20 years. And uh, are you post-certified? Yes. Quickly tell the court of your current duties and responsibilities. Current duties as a detective is to investigate felonies and to also help deputies with their other investigations. I'm going to draw your attention to a specific date, January 3rd of 2020. Were you working that day? Yes. What was your assignment? I was assisting and helping with an execution of a search warrant at 202 North, 1900 East in Fremont County, Idaho. Whose home, home does that belong to? Chad Daybell. Were there other agencies involved? There were. Rexburg PD, FBI, and ERT. Were you involved in the initial search uh, and collection of evidence? Yes. Can you explain that further to the court, please? I helped with the, at the beginning, I helped with the search of the property until I was called to do some other responsibilities on the property. After the execution of that warrant, did you take possession of items found at that location? I did. And can you explain how that came about? I can. Lieutenant Joe Powell had received a property from the ERT and a property log with items. And we took those items, placed them in my vehicle and his vehicle, and transported those to Fremont County Sheriff's Office. After arriving at Fremont County Sheriff's Office, did you take possession of all items collected at the home? I did. Lieutenant Powell gave me all the items to book into evidence and along with the evidence log sheet. And what did you do after you received all those items? The next step is to log those items into evidence. And I used the identifiers that were written on the bags or property and logged those into our evidence. The detective, who has access uh, to your evidence lab at Fremont County Sheriff's Office? Myself and two other detectives. On a later date, did you take additional action with the items that you booked into Fremont County evidence on January 3rd of 2020? I did. What were those, or what action did you take? I logged those items out of evidence that had the same identifiers on them from before. I transported them down to Salt Lake City, Utah to the regional computer forensic lab. And when did you do that? That was January 15th of this year, 2020. Did you take all items that were booked into evidence or just a portion? I only took a portion. What portion of items did you take? That would be the electronics that were listed on the search warrant. Judge, I'm sorry, he, he, he spoke very quickly and I didn't get exactly what you said. So Detective Mattingly, if you'll pull that microphone a little closer to you there, we're making a, be a record. I'm having a difficult time as well. Will you repeat your answer to the last question? Mr. Ramel, if you need to re-ask it, please do. Judge, I'd ask him if he took all items that he had booked in on January 3rd or just a portion of the items and then asked what items he uh, took action with on the 15th. I took a portion of those items. I took the items that were listed on the search warrant that were electronics. And were there clear indicators on the evidence bags uh, when you booked those on the 3rd? Yes, there were and observed those same markings and same bags when you collected them on the 15th? That would be correct. Did you transport them to Salt Lake City by vehicle? I did. Did those items ever leave your custody and control during transportation? They did not. What did you do after arriving at the Regional Computer Forensic Lab? I took the, those items to the lab and transferred them to their evidence technician and left them in their custody. Did you provide them identification? I did. I gave them a, uh, I showed them my office issued law enforcement ID. 
Judge, that's all I have for this witness. Thank you. Any cross-examination, Mr. Pryor? There won't be any questions, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Mattingly, thank you for being here. If you'll please don your mask again, you can be excused from the witness stand. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Rammel, are you going to be calling the next witness? Yes, Judge. Who's that going to be? Judge, the statement next called Gary Liu. Can you give me a title? Is there a title? To Judge, Mr. Liu. Uh, Mr. Liu. Appropriate Lou. for today. All right. Mr. Liu, please come forward. Mr. Du Liu, please stand in front of this uh, plexiglass, raise your right arm, and face the clerk. You saw me swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in the cause now pending will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so be God. I do. Thank you. Mr. Liu, you can have a seat here. Once you've been seated there, you can take off your mask. If you'll pull that microphone up to your chin, we're making a record. Mr. Rammel, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Can I have you state your full name and spell your full name for the record, please? My name is Gary Liu. Last name is spelled L-Y-U. Mr. Liu, where are you employed? I am currently employed with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And how long have you worked for the FBI? Just a little over four years. What position do you currently hold with the FBI? I am a forensic examiner. Can you explain your educational background and training to the court, please? Yes. I have two undergraduate degrees, one in business, one in information technology. I have multiple IT certifications and one specific to forensic examinations and two smartphone analysis. And I'm also FBI CART certified. What office are you currently assigned to? I am at the Intermountain West Regional Computer Forensic Laboratory in Salt Lake City, Utah. Do you have an acronym for that office or it's, that lab? Yes, it's IWRCFL. I'm sorry, your answer? IWRCFL. Mr. Liu, do you have specific training and certification, or cert, certi I'm sorry, certifications Certifications, I'm sorry, of uh, in dealing with for, for forensic examinations. I do. Can you explain those to the court, please? I have a GCFE, which is a certification for forensic examination, and I have a GASF, which is a certification for advanced smartphone forensics. And again, I'm also FBI CAR certified. And as a part of your job and duties in your job, do you commonly examine forensic items such as cellular devices? I do. Mr. Liu, can you generally describe how a forensic examiner conducts a typical investigation of electronic devices? Sure. The forensic examiner usually follows a prescribed set of protocols laid down by the FBI. And these generally include intaking the item, from the submitting agency. And once we intake it, we want to ensure that there's proper legal authority accompanying the evidence items. Once we ensure that there's proper legal authority, we assign specific specimen IDs to each submitted item. And then once we give each submitted item a specimen ID, we generate what we call a chain of custody report and we give a hard copy to the submitting um, agent, and we keep a digital copy of it at the uh, RCFL, the IWRCFL. And then once we do that, we take the submitted um, items to a secure evidence control facility at the lab until it is um, assigned to an examiner. And once the examiner- I'm gonna stop you right there for a second. So until it's assigned to an examiner, is it unusual for more to have one to have more than one forensic examiner assigned to work on a specific case? No. Testify that it's taken into a secure area after that documentation is done. 
what do you typically do next? Once the case is assigned to an examiner, he or she can check out the evidence from the evidence control facility into his or her custody. And usually the first thing we do is to document the condition of the items, anything that's unique about it, such as serial numbers, any damage, things like that. Does the FBI lab you work in have policy and procedure in place to help ensure the integrity of data utilized in forensic examinations? Yes, we do. Can you please tell the court about that, those processes? We use something called a hash value. It's something akin to like a fingerprint for a specific file, something that's very unique. And even if you make a small change to it, it will contaminate the data and you will change the entire hash value. And that's how we verify the integrity and it has not been intentionally or unintentionally modified. So something as small as someone adding a comma to data that would change the hash value? Yes, very much so. And do you use a specific hashing tool? Yes, we do. And are you trained to use that program? Yes, I am. Is that program generally used and accepted within the forensic community? Yes. You explained a bit. I'm going to ask you a couple uh, more questions about the lab receiving items or intake from external law enforcement agents. Can you explain the role of an OST in the lab? An OST is, stands for Operational Support Technician. This person is in charge of intake, among other things, at the lab. Within your procedure and policy within the FBI, does the OST typically assign a specimen ID to each item? Yes. Is a specimen ID given to one device? Yes. Is it ever changed or reused once assigned to a specific device? No. And this process of accepting devices from external law enforcement sources, it's documented? Yes. Is it, uh, and what is it documented upon? It is documented in the chain of custody and form. Chain of custody documents common at the regional computer forensic lab? Yes. Are they just uh, suggested? No, it is required. And are they created in the lab? Yes, uh, they are. They're on location? Yes. Right. Are they kept in the course of regularly conducted uh, activity that goes on there? Yes. Are they generated at the exact time when evidence arrives? Yes. And that's a regular practice that occurs? That's correct. When you specifically are assigned to review a device, does it always have a chain of custody document? Yes. And you yourself, as the analyst, has access to that information and enters information on that? Yes. Judge, I'm gonna have defense provided and then the witness, what has been marked as states, Exhibit 30. Exhibit 30 will be handed to the witness. Mr. Liu, what is this? This is a chain of custody form for a specific item. And how do you know? Because I see the specimen ID, and I see the case number, and I see my name on it is a chain of custody document that you are currently assigned to work on? Yes, it is. Judge, I would move to admit what has been marked as State's Exhibit 30 under uh, Rule 8036, records of a regularly conducted activity. There won't be an objection, Judge. Exhibit 30 will be admitted. Mr. Liu, I'm gonna have you take a look a closer look at that uh, exhibit, what has been marked as Exhibit 30. What is the first entry on that chain? It is dated January 15th, 2020. It shows Bruce Mattingly from the Fremont County Sheriff's Office 
dropping off an evidence, and it was received by our OST, Taylor Couch, at the IWRCFL. And what is the specimen identify, identify, identifier? Do you, re, do you refer to them as specimen ID, specimen identifier numbers? Either one will work. Specimen ID attached with that chain of custody. It is IWR091201. And what item does it refer to? It's an LG cell phone. And when did you first take possession of that item? I took possession of it on January 16th, 2020. And is that reflected on State's Exhibit 30? It is. I'm going to hand you or have the witness, if I could have him handed, what has been marked as State's Exhibit, uh, excuse me, marked and admitted previously as State's Exhibits 28 and 29. The witness will be handed exhibits 28 and 29. Mr. Liu, I'm going to have you look at those. When you're done looking at them, would you look up at me, please? What is that a picture of? These two are pictures of an LG cell phone. And have you seen that phone before? I have. And where was that? When I took possession of it at the RCFL. Anything particular about uh, that phone in those photos that uh, catches your attention? Yes, the phone cover is a clear rubber outer case with purple glitters in it. It has hearts in there too. So uh, safe to assume that you review a lot of cell phones? I do. A lot of cell phones that are black or that color? Yes. So uh, your testimony that easier to recall this device or it stands out when there is a phone case such as this attached to a device? Yes, it does stand out. What did you do with that device? After I took it into my custody, I powered it on attempting to extract the data off the device. Were you able to extract the data off the device? I was not. And why so? The device was locked. I attempted to unlock it, but my, my attempts were unsuccessful. So what did you do next? I uh, submitted a request to FBI headquarters for the unlocking service. And did you take uh, steps to have that sent to be unlocked? Yes, I packaged the phone and I gave the package to our OST to be mailed out to FBI headquarters. Do you recall the specimen ID on that device? Yes, it's the same one I provided earlier. And can you provide it for the court again? Yes, it's IWR091201. And when you sent, uh, made, took steps to have this sent to be unlocked, was it clearly marked with that specimen ID? It was. And was it in fact sent? It was. We have a shipping number for that. And is that reflected on State's Exhibit 30? It is. And did it was, and where was it shipped? Um, FBI headquarters. Did it ever return to your possession? Yes. On March 12th, it came back. And is that reflected on State's Exhibit 30? Yes, it is. And did you take possession of that device? I did. Is it the same device that you identified in State's Exhibit 28 and 29? It is. The same device that you had sent off? That is correct. And did it contain the same specimen ID? It did. Was there anything else uh, added with that when it returned? Yes. When the phone was returned, I also received a 16 gigabyte SD card containing the extracted data from the phone provided by FBI headquarters. 
Was there a hash value generated for that extracted data? There was. And what did you do with those items? I took possession of the extraction and I parsed the data into a forensic tool to generate a report of the extracted data. Mr. Lu, I'm going to stop you right there for a second. Can you explain what parsing is? Parsing in this uh, instance is taking computer language, basically ones and zeros, that's not human readable, and we convert it into a human readable form so we can, as humans, read it and understand it. And do you use a specific program for parsing? I did. And are you trained in that program? I am. Is that program generally accepted in the forensic community? Yes. What did you do with, uh, ap what did you do with uh, the data after parsing? Uh, after I parsed the data, I generated a report of the entire extraction, and I created a working copy of it and gave it to the case agent. What is a working copy? A working copy is a work product that has not been finalized yet that we usually give out to agents who want to see kind of the intermediate steps of what we're working on so they can gather more evidence or look through the, the products themselves. And what medium is... Uh, the working copy provided on? I believe I put it on an optical disc. And that optical disc, uh, do you mark it with identifiers? I did. What, uh, what identifiers did you provide? I marked it as IWR091201 along with the words working copy. And you provided that disc to uh, the working case agents? That's correct. Mr. Liu, we've spoken a little about, uh, or excuse me, was there, uh, before you sent to uh, this item out to case agents, is there another step that you take? Yes, I, the last step that I did was that I re-verified the original hash value that was given to me by FBI headquarters. And the two hash values match. And you, did you run your own hash value analysis? Sorry, can you? I'm sorry, you, you ran your own hash value analysis. Yes, I did. Prior to and, okay, so my question is, is uh, in terms of the hash value itself, uh, did the pre and post examination of those values match? Yes, they did. And what does that tell you? The hash value, if they match, that means that the data was not tampered with, was not modified in any way, shape, or form. It means that the ending extracted files were the exact same as what the FBI headquarters gave me. There were no changes at all. So something as small as a comma would have changed that? Yes. Them being identical shows that that was not even added? That's correct. Nothing was changed. And at that point, you provided the working copies two case agents? That's correct. Judge, that's all I have for this one. Thank you, Mr. Rammel. Cross-examination, Mr. Pryor. Sir, um, what is the name of the parsing program that you use? It's called Physical Analyzer. Nothing further, Judge. Thank you. Any redirect, Mr. Rammel? Not based on that, Judge. All right. You can be excused, Mr. Liu. Thank you for being here. Were the exhibits handed to the bailiff? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rammel, is, your is it your next witness or Mr. Woods? Uh, it is my next witness, Your Honor. And who is that going to be? Uh, Judge Benjamin D. Benjamin D. Yeah, for today's purposes, title of Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean or D? Uh, D as in dog, Dean. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dean, if you'll please stand here in front of the witness thing. Up a little closer, raise your right arm, face the clerk. You saw me swear a court firm that the testimony was given to the House of the Yes. Mr. Dean, you can have a seat here at the witness chair. 
Once you've been seated there, you may remove your mask. Please pull that microphone and aim it at your chin. And speak directly into that microphone as we're making a recording. Mr. Ramley, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Can you please state your name and spell your full name for the record? Benjamin Dean. Uh, last name is D-E-A-N. Where are you employed? Uh, Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investi Investigation. And how long have you worked for the FBI? For approximately six years. What position do you currently hold with the FBI? I'm an intelligence analyst. Can you briefly describe your educational and professional background? So when I joined the Bureau, I had a, a bachelor's degree in foreign area studies, and uh, my first position was with the language services section um, at FBI headquarters. And my job there was to uh, review electronic communications, uh, of, uh, lawfully obtained electronic communications of FBI subjects throughout the field uh, across the country. Um, after that uh, position, I became an intelligence analyst. I attended the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, where I received training um, in, uh, in topics related to my job. And, and I, I continue to do trainings uh, on, on the web, uh, web-based trainings at work, um, and also in-person trainings. What office are you currently assigned to? Uh, I'm currently assigned to the Salt Lake City Division. Mr. Dean, what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities? So I'm an analyst, uh, as an analyst in the field, I'm embedded on an investigative squad, so I uh, support active cases. But my main job is to uh, analyze information and make assessments about specific threats. So some of my duties day to day include uh, reviewing information that's collected by special agents, uh, looking through that information for trends and patterns, uh, making um, and then writing reports and giving briefings with uh, my findings and uh, recommendations. Do you have any specific training or experience or specific training related to reviewing electronic devices? I do. Can you explain, or excuse me, so training or experience, can you explain that to the court, please? Yes. So as I mentioned before, uh, my, my position in language services uh, gave me the opportunity to gain daily experience uh, reviewing, interpreting, and reporting on electronic communications for various subjects um, uh, who, were, who were part of investigations, who were, who were uh, under investigation for a variety, a variety of threats and uh, violations. Um, after that position, uh, of course, I, I went to the FBI Academy, and I was trained, one of the topics and subject matter that they trained us on was digital evidence collection and exploitation, and also the use of uh, software for telephone analysis. So I continue to uh, keep my skills um, and knowledge current in that in those areas. Are you involved in the investigation into Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell? Yes. When did your involvement in that investigation begin? It began in late March of this year, 2020. What was your first assignment in, that, in your involvement, or your first assignment uh, with that assignment? Or with, I'm sorry, your assignment that you were initially given in March of this year. My first assignment for, the, for this investigation was to review tips that were submitted to the FBI's Office of Public Affairs website. Uh, those tips were submitted uh, pursuant to a pr press release that was issued on the 5th of March 20, uh, this year, 2020, by the FBI and the Rexburg Police Department uh, regarding the disappearance of Tylee, Val Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, who were missing at the time. And uh, the press release noted that they both children had been seen at Yellowstone National Park on the 8th of September, 2019. And uh, it it requested that anyone who was present at the park that day, who, who visited the park that day, who had photos or videos to send them in, um, in, in case they might uh, be of use to the investigation. Have you received other assignments in your involvement in this investigation? Yes. And what were they? Uh, 
I was assigned to assist with the review of devices, electronic storage devices seized from the property of Chad Daybell uh, on the 3rd of January this year. Uh, my first, first two devices that I reviewed were a hard drive and a thumb drive. And when did you complete your review of those initial devices? I completed those devices in late May of this year. Were you asked to review data from any other devices after you had completed those initial review, uh, initial reports that you had generated? Yes, I was. And what was the additional devices that you were asked to review? I was asked to review two Blu-ray discs containing data uh, that was pulled from devices seized from Chad Davil's property on the same date, January 3rd, 2020. And were these discs labeled? They were. They were labeled with uh, unique FBI specimen numbers. The first disc was labeled IWR091201, and the second disc was labeled IWR091202. And both discs also had the words working copy written on them. Uh, which disc did you begin reviewing first? I first began reviewing IWR091201. And when did you begin your review of the disc labeled IWR091201? I began the review on the 26th of May, 2020. What was the process you used to begin that review? I used a Blu-ray reader to to open up the disk, the contents of the disk on my FBI issued laptop computer. I, uh, I saw that the main file on the disk was labeled IWR091201. I began looking through the contents of that file and located a subfolder titled, uh, excuse me, I located a subfolder that had uh, several items in it. One of the items was, um, was an application file titled cellbrightreader.exe and the other one was a UFDR file uh, with the name IWR091201 report.ufdr. I launched, I double clicked uh, the, the application file to launch Cellbrite Reader and from there uh, I opened up the UFDR file to, to view the contents of that. Mr. Dean, I'm going to go back for one second. You stated that as you opened it, uh, the disk was named, the file disk was named, or had a specimen number. That number specifically matched the number on the outside of the disk? Yes, it did. Uh, had it not, what would you have done? I would have contacted, um, I would have contacted the, the person at the regional RCFL, Regional Computer Forensics Lab uh, down in Salt Lake City to find out why there was a discrepancy. But no discrepancy existed with this disk? No. How does data uh, appear in Cellbrite Reader? Cellbrite Reader organizes uh, the content of a device, meaning all of, the, all of the data items that are found on the device, into categories based on an item's file type. Um, it, uh, it, the category names are in, in the Cellbrite window are are on the left in a tree report and they're arranged in alphabetical order and when you double click one of the category names uh, a new data tab opens up and you can see all of the items that fit within that that are that belong to that category so for example autofill uh, calendar items call log items um, contacts sms messages and so forth What file types do you typically look at to determine the user of a given device? I typically look at, I'd look to see if there's a user device, or sorry, excuse me, a user, um, a device user listed. Um, I also look, if it's a phone, I look to see uh, what the phone number is that's associated with the device. Um, I look at the content of the communications stored on the device, so text messages, multimedia messages, emails, uh, and then I also look at the images. Mr. Dean, did you look at those file types for this device, the device we're speaking of, IWR091201? Yes, I did. When reviewing those items, did it become apparent 
what type of device it was? Yes, it did. What type of device uh, was it apparent to you to be? It was a cell phone. Did it become apparent after reviewing those file types who the user of the device was? Yes, it did. And who was that? Uh, it was apparent to me that uh, Tammy Daybell was the user of the cell phone. Why so? There's several reasons uh, that it became apparent to me. First off, the device user was listed as Tammy. Second, the phone number listed for the device uh, matched the phone number um, that uh, we had in other documents obtained in this investigation, um, which, which showed uh, Tammy Daybell was associated with that phone number. Uh, there were incoming communications, incoming messages on the device addressing Tammy by name. There were outgoing communications from the device user Again, text messages and emails and multimedia messages uh, with the device user introducing herself as Tammy or signing off, for, for example, on an email as Tammy. Um, there were also communications or messages with uh, group messages, for example, and also call items and also uh, direct messages with members of the Daybell family. Uh, and those, those, the content of those messages suggested a close family relationship between the device user and the members of the family. Uh, by the way, all the, all the members or all, all the members in those group messages uh, that I'm referring to as the Daybell family members were all also had contact names stored in the device. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, there were device notifications uh, found on the device for, um, for new posts by, by the Daybell family, by names matching the Daybell family members. Uh, onto a Facebook group titled Daybells and MERS. And there, the there were photos that showed Tammy Daybell and uh, other members of her family, including Chad Daybell and uh, both. There, so there were photos by herself and also in combination with, uh, with her family members. And lastly, uh, I noticed that all of the outgoing communications on that device emails, text messages, phone calls, uh, they all ceased on the evening of October 18th, 2019, which based on my knowledge of the case was the day before or the, the evening before uh, first responders found Tammy Daybell deceased in her residence. So after that review, very clear that you believe that the device belonged to Tammy Daybell? Yes. I'm gonna draw your attention to September 9th 2019, did Tammy's phone receive any text messages that day? Yes, it did. Were there any messages sent to Tammy's phone that day that caught your attention? Yes, there was. Uh, what was the number, the phone number from what those, from which those messages were sent? It was 208 was there a contact name stored on the phone for that number? There was. What was the contact name associated with that number? Chad. Throughout your review of this device, that device, had you re uh, reviewed other messages sent by the contact uh, with the number associated with the contact saved as Chad? Yes, I had. Based on your review of those other messages sent by this number, who do you believe that that number belonged to? It was, it was clear to me that that number belonged to uh, Tammy Daybell's husband, Chad and Guy Daybell. Why? Again, there's several reasons for that. First off, uh, the phone number, the ending in 9374, uh, it, it also matched with, uh, with the phone number that uh, I was aware of being on documents other documents collected or obtained in this investigation and, and showing Chad Daybell as uh, showing that that number was one of the numbers, one of the phones used, phone numbers used by Chad Daybell. Uh, in addition, uh, the contact name in the phone that we're talking about, Chad, named Chad, was also part of group messages um, with members of the Daybell family. There, the content of the messages between Tammy, the device user, and the contact Chad 
uh, with this 9374 number uh, suggested that Tammy and this and this other this other user was were living in the same house. And uh, I'm going to stop you right there for a sure. second. The content of these messages over a period of days, weeks, months, approximately. Uh, I would say months, if I recall, the the earlier text messages stored on the device. Uh, most of them began uh, in in August any, of 2019. Anything in the message that would messages that would uh, suggest that uh, the individuals between these two devices were married. Yes. Uh, specifically uh, regarding to affection. Yes, there were incoming messages on the device, so from the 9374 number to uh, the phone um, with statements or phrases of affection such as I love you, here to kiss you, can't sleep without you. Okay, I'm going to draw your attention uh, back to the messages uh, received on Tammy's phone on September 9th. I'm going to hand you what I'm going to show the fence and hand you what has been marked as States Exhibit 31 for admission. Exhibit 31 is being handed to the witness. I'm going to have you take a look at that, Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean, what is that? This uh, is a copy of the messages sent between Chad and Tammy Daybell on September 9th, 2019. How do you know this? Uh, I know this because I reviewed these exact same messages in this exact same conversation, message conversation, um, while I was doing the review of the device. Um, Mr. Dean, is it a true and accurate representation of the messages that you reviewed between those two numbers that were sent on September 9th, 2019, starting at 11.53.27. Yes, it is. Judge, I would move to admit. There's no objection, Judge. Thank you. Exhibit 31 will be admitted. It is now a good time to take a recess. Mr. Ramel, how long do you expect uh, the continued questioning of this witness to take? Judge, uh, Judge, two, three minutes left if you want to push through. Let's do that, and then we'll take a recess before we uh, engage in cross-examination if that's going to take place. You may proceed, Mr. Rennell. Mr. Dean, will you please read, uh, look at Exhibit 31 that has been admitted. Will you please read aloud the messages in this exhibit, including time stamps and contact name? Yes. 9-9-2019, a.m., from Chad. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. 9-9-2019, a.m. From Chad. Gonna shower now and then go right for a while at BYU. Love you. 9-9-2019, p.m. To Chad. Good for you. 9-9-2019, 2.48.20 p.m. From Chad. I'm back home now. 
you testified, Mr. Dean, that these messages initially caught your attention. Yes, they did. Why? The first message uh, in particular caught my attention because it was longer and more detailed than any of the other messages between Chad and Tammy uh, that were stored on the device. Uh, most of the messages between Chad and Tammy were relatively short and they dealt with, uh, with matters uh, around the house, for example, picking up whether to pick up food for an animal, um, the depositing or cashing of checks, and the comings and goings of one or the other, when they would get home, when, when they would be leaving. Um, it, uh, it appeared to me to be the first and only uh, message sent from T Chad to Tammy in which Chad was um, describing and, and informing Tammy of his, uh, his day's events in, uh, in such a, a lengthy and, and detailed manner. Uh, the other thing that caught my attention was the date. Uh, if you recall earlier in my testimony, um, I mentioned how my first assignment in this case was reviewing the tips that um, came in pursuant to the press release uh, that was asking for visitors who had, who had been to Yellowstone National Park on the 8th of September 2019 to send in photos and videos that may help in the investigation. And that was because uh, Ty Lee and JJ had been seen at Yellowstone that day. Um, after reviewing uh, hundreds of those uh, photographs and videos, I, uh, in consulting with my, with the team members on the FBI side who, who were also involved in this case, uh, about the timeline, because I'll leave that timeline, I was well aware that that date, uh, the 8th of September 2019, was the last day that Tylee Ryan was seen alive. So upon reading this text message in which Chad uh, appears to claim to uh, to have shot, or to have started a fire, shot and killed a large animal, and buried it on his property. Uh, I recognized that it was uh, it was sent uh, the, the day after Tyler Ryan was last seen alive, and I became concerned. What did you do after you reviewed those messages? I, re I relayed the information to the case agents. Judge, that's all I have for this one. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess. Um, why don't we go back on the record at 10 minutes to 3 o'clock, and we'll begin cross-examination at that time. Okay. All right.
Thank you. Please be seated. We'll go back on the record here in State v. Daybell. Uh, the state had just finished its direct examination of Mr. Dean, and we took a brief recess in the afternoon. Mr. Pryor, do you wish to cross-examine this witness? If I may, Your Honor. You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Dean, can you give me the range of when the messages started from what you gathered from the phone? And, when, and obviously, you've already uh, provided us with the end date of October 18th of 2019. What was the start date of those messages that you started to review, sir? Are you referring to the text messages, text messages. SMS only? Well, at this point, we're going to get through all of the varieties. If you want okay. to just provide that with the start of all of those, I would appreciate that. We can cut this a little shorter then. Sh sure. Thank so you, uh, that information, I think, is in the report that I generated okay, uh, after the review. This, if I could be definitely accurate if I were able to consult that. Uh, otherwise, I would just be giving estimations. Okay. Oh, so there's... I do have the report in the refresh. Mr. Pryor, do you want that handed to the witness? I do, Judge. All right. Hand the witness the report to refresh his recollection, and then the, the judge wants to give him instructions on that. I, I okay. Prefer. The report will be handed to the witness. Witness, if you want to review your report and then let us know when you're ready, we'll have you turn the report upside or over on its. Uh, back so that you can't see it, and then we'll have you testify to what you know. Take your time. You may. Uh, Mr. Dean, are you ready? I'm ready. Have you had your uh, memory refreshed by looking at your notes? Yes, I have. Mr. Pryor, you may inquire. Would you please tell me what the start date of those messages was, sir? The start date of the SMS messages that were on the device was July 29th, 2019. And then again, the end messages were... Um, October. The end of the outgoing messages 
were was October 18th, 2019. Is there a difference between the outgoing and incoming messages dates? Yeah. So, in other words, there up until October 18th, messages, SMS messages were both received and sent from the device, sent being outgoing. And then after the 18th of October, there were no further outgoing or sent messages from the device. Were there any incoming messages to the device? There were. And when did that date end, sir? There, I believe in the days following uh, late October and also into November, uh, I would say that there were periodic incoming uh, calls uh, to the device uh, up until the, the seizure of the phone. Okay. Do you have an idea about how many? Mm, I'd say between 10 to 20, just, just uh, an estimation. Were those included in your report? Uh, not all of them. I'm sorry. Were those included in your report? Uh, not, not all of them. Uh, I, I made reference to items that appeared on the phone with dates after the 18th in general, but I do not, um, I do not uh, comment in detail about about the numbers and, and timestamps of them. So why don't we talk about the emails in the same range? Uh, if you could give me the uh, the identifying dates on the range of the emails and then all of the other uh, forms of messages that came in, I would appreciate if you could go through those during the the, the entire. Uh, length of the activity of the phone or just after the 18th? No, what I want is that there were, you, you talked about text messages, you talked about mm -hmm. emails, and you talked about instant messages. Were there any other forms of messages that came through that phone? Uh, not that I can think of at this time. Okay. At this time, so, or are you still looking into that? Um, the device is, can be reviewed in the in future, but uh, okay. at this point, I'm not aware of any further uh, categories of messages. Okay, so let's go back to my original uh, question. Well, one of my original questions is now give me the rate, date of range for the emails now, please. May I consult the... Absolutely, the please do. Take whatever time you need, sir. For the record, the witness is reviewing his report to refresh his recollection. Did you refresh your recollection? I did. Um, so in this report, I include I do include all the entirety of the items. It would it would be a very very long report. What I did was uh, I included selected items. So I have the date range for the selected items, but I do not have uh, the date range for all the emails total on the device. And the decision to decide which items you're going to include is, is that was that your decision? Was it not? It was. So the, the, the determination as to whether you thought it was important or not in terms of which emails you provided to the prosecutor and ultimately to me was based on what you thought was important. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. And what I'd like to ask you is that if we go from July 29th to October 18th, we're looking, um, sir, at approximately uh, 80 days and your testimony where you said that these were long messages and that you found that unusual. You found that unusual that in an 80-day period, this, was a length, this message was a lengthy message. So you're making the de determination that based on an 80-day period... Judge, I'd object to the form of the question. That's getting into a compound. Well, I'm trying to, to explain, Judge, and if I... I think you need to be able to be asked one question at a time. Okay. Well, Mr. Pryor, I'll let you lay a little bit of foundation for your question, but uh, if you can be more concise and limited right. to one question. The range for the emails was 80 days, correct? For the, for the, for the SMS messages? The SMS messages was 80, uh, the emails. The SMS messages was 80 days, is that correct? 
Around 80 days, yes. Okay, and in 80 days you made the determination that this was the le most lengthy of the messages, is that correct? Yes, okay. from between Chad and Tammy. Right. Sent from Chad to Tammy. Now what other, were there instant messages in this as well? There, again, there were, there were text messages or, or SMS messages, there were multimedia messages, and there were emails that had, also had content, and, and I don't believe, there, there were uh, indications of Facebook um, activity on the device and the use of Facebook Messenger, okay. but the content, as far as content of Facebook chats or any other uh, chat messaging items, uh, no, I'm not aware of any of those. And what was the range again of the multimedia? The multimedia messages, I'd have to consult my report one more time. Okay, go ahead. Multimedia? July 17th to the 25th of October 2019. Now I'd like to direct your attention back to, um, and obviously you didn't pull the Facebook messaging, That's, that would be very difficult, would it not? It, it, it simply wasn't on the device, okay. and if I may correct myself, uh, the the beginning of the first S MMS message on the phone was 7.31. I misspoke just now. Okay. And that's fine. Thank you. On the, um, the message uh, from uh, Chad to Tammy at 11.53.27, could you judge, does he have the exhibit up there? Could we get him the exhibit? Which exhibit are you reserving? Exhibit 30, 31? I believe it's 31, Your Honor. The witness will be handed Exhibit 31. Your Honor, I believe it's, he still has it. I think he still does, too. Okay. Does that say 31 on it, Mr. Dean? Again, could you do me the favor of rereading the uh, message of 1153.27 again for me, please? Yes. Would you like just the just the, the text of the message or you can da time stamp or? Well, we've already established 1153 on September 9th, I think. I think that's right. clear. So if you would just read the content of the message, I would appreciate it, sir. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all of the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. So, um, your purpose today is to um, is to obtain any messages on Tammy Daybell's phone, correct? And provide us with information about messages that were on Tammy Daybell's phone, correct? Yes. Okay. Your purpose today is not to decide whether or not wood was burned in a fire pit, correct? No. You don't have any information as to Judge, I'd object. This is argumentative. It's not argumentative, Judge. I'm, I'm trying to lay down exactly what the scope of what he's trying to do today. I mean, I think I ought to be able to inquire that he's here Judge. just to, to recite what a text message is and, the, and how he obtained it. Uh, I want to clarify that he's not suggesting to anyone that uh, Chad Daybell did not burn firewood in a fire pit. And I think I need to be able to go into that. I think it's pretty clear from the testimony and the foundation that's been laid by this witness that he works at an FBI lab and then he uh, analyze the phone. I think it's also clear that, that uh, he's not trying to testify as to what those messages are. He's just saying what was found on the phone. So I agree it's unnecessary. 
um, and I think it is argumentative. Okay. I have nothing further, Judge. Thank you. All right. Redirect Mr. Rammel. Nothing based on that, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for appearing today. If you'll hand that exhibit to the bailiff here, and then if you'll hand that report back to Mr. Rammel. The court notes that that, that report was not marked and uh, it's not part of the evidence. You can be excused. Mr. Dean, thank you for being here today. Mr. Rammel or Wood, do you have any other witnesses? No, Your Honor. The state rests then. Mr. Pryor, do you desire to call any witnesses? There'll be no presentation today, Your Honor. Thank you. Do the parties wish to make closing arguments? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Wood or Mr. Ram will allow you to do so. Thank you. If you'll please stand. Make sure you pull that microphone close to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm aware this court is very well aware of what the burden of proof is for a preliminary hearing. Uh, due to the wide audience it reaches, uh, I'd just uh, point out that Idaho criminal rule states that if the court finds that an offense has been committed and that there is probable or sufficient cause to believe the defendant committed the offense, the court must find that defendant over to answer in district court. And so, Your Honor, just, uh, just a brief recap. On November 25th, the Rexburg Police Department was notified of a missing child, J.J. Vallow. The next day, uh, their investigation begins. What they discover in the course of that investigation is that there's another missing child, Tylee Ryan, and they discover that the last day she's seen is September 8th in Yellowstone National Park. They find evidence that on September 9th, Chad Daybell sent a text to his then wife, Tammy Daybell, at 11.53 in the morning about burning limb debris and burying a raccoon in his pet cemetery. That very same morning, Alex Cox's phone pings in that same area, that pet cemetery area on Chad Daybell's property. On June 9th, Tylee Ryan, who we've identified through DNA, is found buried, burnt, dismembered portions of her in a green melted bucket, buried with animals in the pet cemetery. Through that investigation, they find that the last known sighting of J.J. Vallow was September 22nd. I'm sorry, the last known sighting of J.J. Vallow was September 22nd. Similarly, on September 23rd, Alex Cox's phone pings on Chad Daybell's property. Near those pings, on June, where those pings are located on the north side of Chad Daybell's property, on June 9th, J.J. is found, wrapped in a garbage bag with a white, another white garbage bag wrapped around his head, bound in duct tape. Your Honor, for the court to find probable cause of concealment of a felony, it must find that uh, the evidence concealed uh, would be, uh, is, would tend to be evidence in a felony proceeding. That's the test given by state law, uh, by, by, uh, by case law in state v. Patia, in state uh, versus your your mola. This court, as the finder of fact, is entitled to uh, to a reasonable inference based on the state of the bodies of J.J. Val and Tyree Ryan that they were victims of a homicide. This court can also take note of the through the evidence presented that both Chad Daybell and his wife Lori Daybell were aware that Lori Daybell was charged with, Lori Vallow Daybell was charged with desertion, two felony counts of desertion of a minor child in Madison County. Uh, and clearly the location and welfare of these bodies was evidence in that felony proceeding. Those bodies were concealed. One of them was destroyed. They were located on Chad Daybell's property. Alex Cox, whose phone pinged near those locations, became his brother-in-law less than two months later when Chad married Lori Vallow. For the court to find probable cause of, a, of conspiracy on these charges, on counts three and four, or on counts two and four, 
it must find probable cause of at least one overt act and an agreement. State law in Idaho is very clear through State versus Gallatin and through the Idaho jury, criminal jury instructions that an agreement need not be formal or expressed, but it may be inferred from the circumstances or it may be implied by the conduct of the parties. Both Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow attempted to convince Melanie Gibb to either not cooperate with police or to provide false information to the police. At this point, they were married. Uh, in terms of finding probable cause that an overt act was committed, this court watched itself a, a video of Lori, at, that, at this time now, Lori Daybell, telling police officers that J.J. Vallow was, was in Arizona with Melanie Gibb. And then through a phone call where Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell were present, you heard Lori admit to that when she said she did what she felt the Lord was instructing her to do. Your Honor, for purposes of probable cause, the state has met its burden on all four felony counts, both counts of concealment and both counts of conspiracy to, to conceal. And we'd ask that this court bind Mr. Daybell over to answer in district court. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Judge. Judge, in this particular case, uh, we have four counts and we have two uh, identifiable children. Uh, the testimony, according to this prosecuting attorney, is that Mr. Daybell was married to, uh, to Ms. Vallow. That that's, doesn't provide anything. Not only doesn't it pro provide an overt act, it doesn't provide an agreement. Marriage is not an overt act towards a conspiracy, and marriage is not an agreement to, con to, to conceal or to conspire. In addition, what they have is they have uh, Mr. Daybell making a comment to a police officer. That is not an overt act to conspire or an agreement to conspire as well. And then what they have is they have an obscure text message that says, I burned some items in the fire pit and I buried a raccoon. Now, they can suggest whatever they want with that, but there's been no indication of any evidence that this act took place on the 9th or the 22nd or 23rd or whatever day it was. And quite honestly, Judge, they don't even come close on the concealment of Tylee. They don't even come close on the concealment of JJ. And the conspiracy, they lack the agreement. And quite honestly, Judge, if this is what the evidence is in terms of an overt act, I would submit to the court that I understand the burden in a preliminary hearing, but they aren't even close on the conspiracy in either suggestion, that uh, in either case, in regards to an overt act plus an agreement. I'm respectfully asking the court to dismiss the charges. They haven't met their burden, and I don't believe they uh, have provided any near the, the type of evidence that is necessary to even overcome that small threshold. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. The court is going to take a recess. I'm going to review my notes, uh, collect my thoughts. I will make a ruling here today momentarily. It will be a few moments, a few minutes, and then we'll come back in, and I'll do that on the record orally. We'll be in recess until that time. All rise.
Thank you. Please be seated. We're back on the re record in CR 2220-755, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. The court took a brief recess after all the evidence and closing arguments had pres been presented to it. Uh, the court notes that uh, the reason we hold a preliminary hearing is to establish probable cause. The obligation of the magistrate is to determine whether or not probable cause has been shown uh, pursuant to Rule 5.1 of the Idaho Criminal Rules. It designates that if a magistrate finds that a public offense has been committed and that there is probable or sufficient cause to believe that the defendant committed the offense, the magistrate must immediately require the defendant to answer in district court. The court finds after reviewing all of the testimony that has been, pre been presented here, as well as exhibits one through 31, as well as uh, the argument that has been made by both the state's defense and the, or excuse me, the state's attorney and the defense attorney, the court finds that the state has met its burden of probable cause. And I find that uh, there is probable or sufficient cause to believe that the defendant, Chad Daybell, committed the offenses counts one through four as designated in the amended criminal complaint. I will bind the defendant over to the district court and there will be an arraignment set on August 21st at 9 a.m. That will be in front of Judge Boyce. It's my understanding that will be held remotely via Zoom, but I, I will leave that up to Judge Boyce uh, to, uh, to decide that. So that will take care of the findings here today. It's my understanding there's also one final issue that uh, the state as well as defense would like to take up. Is that correct, Mr. Wood? I, I can put it, put it out. Yes, Your Honor. Um, uh, just a, a stipulation that uh, the defense and the state have entered into that we will uh, waive any um, deadline for the filing of a, a transfer of trial uh, for at least uh, 60 days after the date of arraignment. Okay. Mr. Pryor, it's my understanding that the stipulation isn't that a transfer of trial venue can take place, but that the deadline to file that motion, if one is going to be filed by either you or the state, is 60 days from today's date. Is that correct? That is correct, Judge. And I want to make it clear that that motion for transfer of trial, there are actually two types. There's transfer within the judicial district and transfer outside of the judicial district. And we are not specifying uh, in the event we choose to file a motion for change venue or the state does, that we are not limiting ourselves to the, just the judi this judicial district. We could pursue it outside the judicial district as well. Thank you, Judge. The court notes that a stipulation has been reached. It's been put here on the record between the state and the defense. I will honor that stipulation. It will be ordered that uh, 60 days from today's date will be the deadline for either the state or the defense to file a motion to transfer the location of the trial within or without District 7 here in the state of Idaho. With that, is there anything else we need to take up here today, Mr. Wood? Not from the state. Mr. Pryor. Not from the defense judge. Thank you for your consideration. I appreciate the zealous representation that has been uh, taking place here today. I'm very impressed with the attorneys, the argument that has been made, as well as the, uh, the investigation. The court will be in recess. Thank you all. All right.